following is from the German ideology, where Marx is trying hard to praise the secularism and even atheism of the bourgeoisie, but all sorts of other attitudes, it seems to me, leak out of the passage. Quote, the bourgeoisie, whenever it has got the upper hand, has put an end to all feudal, patriotic, idyllic relations. It has pitilessly torn asunder the motley feudal ties that bound man to his natural superiors and has left remaining no other nexus between man and man than naked self-interest, than callous cash payment. It has drowned the most heavenly ecstasies of religious fervor, of chivalrous enthusiasm, of Philistine sentimentalism in the icy waters of egoistic calculation." Unquote. This sort of claim about ideology is not heard much anymore, at least not in that form. But the term is still a strong epithet in many other ways, at least among the so-called chattering classes. It now suggests, again, the variety of cultural sins noted above, with a few more added. Conformism, consumerist materialism, pompous self-satisfaction, self-deceit, and hypocrisy as a whole way of life. This cultural characterization, self-deceived satisfaction, is often explained as the only effective strategy for dealing with the deep, permanent conflict in bourgeois culture between the inheritance of a largely Christian humanism on the one hand and a ruthless, remorseless, secular capitalism on the other, all ending up in what Nietzsche famously called a wretched contentment. There are plenty of other stories about the presumed cultural contradictions of capitalism, like the view that liberal democratic capitalism requires a kind of morality of prudence and responsibility, which it also must undermine by promoting ever more creatively self-indulgence and hedonism, all in order to create the conditions of the expanding consumption on which capitalism depends. We could be here all night listing such theories and objections. Let's just say that in general the epithet is meant to convey that the, the charge of a self-deceived or hypocritical disguised egoism and selfishness, often parading as entitlement claims, or a complacent satisfaction with low-minded, uninspiring, vulgar ends or goals, or usually both. In historical actuality, the great ideal of a free life is just well-organized selfishness, producing a lowest common denominator level of cultural crudity. At this point in the story, we come to an odd twist, for by now the view that bourgeois civilization represents a kind of failure or is historically exhausted is much more widespread and goes much deeper than a concern with egoism or schlocky taste. For at just the moment in the 19th century when Western European societies, for all of their visible flaws, seem to start paying off the Enlightenment's promissory notes, reducing human misery by the application of its new science and technology, increasing the authority of appeals to reason in life, reducing the divisive public role of religion, extending the revolutionary claim of individual right to an ever wider class of subjects, accelerating the extension of natural scientific explanation, and more and more actually gaining what Descartes had so boldly promised, the mastery of nature, it also seemed at just this moment that many of the best, most creative minds produced within and as products of such societies rose up in protest, even despair at the social organization and norms that made all of this possible. In painting, literature, and music, as well as philosophy, bourgeois modernity as a whole became not only a great problem, but a very confusing, largely distasteful fate. One can hear this most dramatically in the rapid and radical changes in music, from Wagner to Schoenberg and Webern. But roughly the same modernist trajectory, the thematization of art itself as a problem, the concentration on form, the assumption of the historical exhaustion of prior forms, a liberationist sensibility demanding ever greater creative freedom, occurred in drama, painting, poetry, and novels. The whole hour could be used up just with the recitation of the list of modernist anxieties in literature and the arts and it would be quite a long evening indeed if we added the themes of much 20th century European philosophy. The end of metaphysics, the end of philosophy, the impotence of reason, failed signifiers, the death of the subject, the end of man, negative dialectics, the impossibility of poetry, the end of the novel, absolute contingency, anti-humanism, so on and so on. It's as if the sorts of achievements that bourgeois philosophers like Locke and Hegel, however different, had thought would count as monumental human accomplishments. The end of sectarian religious war, 
the creation of some zone of privacy or domestic intimacy, health, equality under the law, rights protection, relative security, and so forth, now to many of great intelligence and imagination were not being exactly rejected, but were simply somehow not enough. What sort of a philosophical problem is that? How adequate is a philosophical response that simply says they were wrong, it is enough, or we just need more of it, or it's more extensive realization? This dissatisfaction is so extreme that although much of European modernism was inspired by a revolutionary consciousness and a hope for a radical acceleration of the modern trajectory, it's also not an exaggeration to say that such aspirations were increasingly overshadowed by something darker, something like a high culture bourgeois self-hatred. Indeed, it's been suggested that the two most successful and catastrophic mass movements of the 20th century, fascism and communism, seem largely nourished by this well, the former rejecting the ends of peace, security, and individual well-being for the sake of a return to blood and soil, collectivist, archaic primitivism, the latter for the sake of a rapid acceleration forward out of bourgeois society beyond the basic oppositions of individualist bourgeois society for the sake of a class classless future. This must have something to do with the appeal of such a backward glancing, even occasionally fascist sensibility, to so many modern artists and philosophers like Eliot, Lawrence, Pound, and Heidegger, and the revolutionary leap forward attempted by so many artists and intellectuals, especially after the international collapse of the capitalist system in 1929. Now, right at the center of all this European pessimism is a profound suspicion in particular about the basic philosophical core of modern bourgeois political philosophy, the notion central to the self-understanding and legitimation of bourgeois life, the free, self-determining, responsible individual. Nowadays, one has to get in, in the back of a rather long queue of complainants to register an objection about any faith in such a conception or ideal. Again, though, the question remains about all of this cultural history, is any of this narrative of the historical fate of certain ideals, especially the ideal of freedom, important for philosophy? To a large extent, an answer to that question will certainly depend on what sort of story one tells and just what one claims to learn about what Hegel called the actuality of an idea, and just how whatever it is that one learns is invoked to make a philosophical point about adequacy or legitimacy. Confronting that problem would require something, trying something obviously quite foolish in this context, at least a brief attempt to say something about the historical faith of such an ideal, and what, if anything, such a faith distinctly reveals about the limitations and tensions inherent in the ideal itself. So I now have to take a deep breath and try to say something in support of this kind of an idea. That will take two steps. First, some discussion of the schematic dimensions of the problem just what is involved in what I've been calling the core bourgeois ideal of free life? And secondly, what about this so-called historical fate? Obviously, the basic question depends on what one takes to be the conditions that have to be satisfied for a life to count as a free life, as one's own. The simplest condition would seem to be freedom from external constraint. However one determines what is to be done, one can be said to be free only if one is not impeded or coerced in the pursuit of such ends. This can be so minimal a requirement that, according to Hobbes, it's the sort of freedom that can loosely be attributed to water running downhill, free if not damned or externally diverted. And, as Rousseau pointed out, for human beings, we should count for the most part as relevant impediments, not natural barriers like gravity and walls, but being subjected to the will of others, the person who pushed us or locked us in. However, most of us would agree that being able to do what you want is not sufficient to satisfy the criterion just described, that we also have to know something about how you ended up wanting what you want. The idea is that we have to be able to describe a certain sort of self-relation if we are to meet that requirement. For there are a lot of things you might want to do, and even that you regularly do, that you devoutly wish you did not want to do. The most famous example is probably Plato's in the Republic of Leontius, who cannot resist looking at scores of corpses as he passes by, and so does what he wants, but rebukes himself for having done so, 